I just, for the audience's sake, I just want to try to organize what happened in their minds just beyond the story um, that you had to go through. And that was with any autoimmunity, those of you that are struggling, there's, you know, there's primary biochemical components that are triggers always. Um, and there's four categories of those triggers. Those triggers are food. There are chemical exposures, like in your case, arsenic. There are nutritional deficits that are triggers. And then there's microbial triggers, um, bacteria, fungus, other types of microbial imbalances. And so that that's what you just described so eloquently is that just identifying and, and finding those triggers, you were really able to get to a, a really big place. Now there's there's two other categories. So whereas biochemistry has that was that category and then under biochemistry, there are those four subcategories of triggers. There's also a physical category, which is, you know, how you move through the world, your exercise, your activity, your muscle strength, whether you're obese, whether you have scoliosis, like structure dictates function. So that matters, right? Square tires don't roll. And then there's one other category, which is the emotional spiritual category. And this is where a lot of people in today's world are really struggling too, right? And so all three of these categories, if you imagine a triangle, um, three sides, right? At the hub in the center of this triangle, you have your genetics, which are a gift from God. They're not a curse. I promise you, your genes are a gift. But your genes are basically being sent messages by your physical, your chemical, and your spiritual choices every day that you make, right? And so if those messages are congruent with healthy genes, then you express health. And if those choices are incongruent, then your genes are so smart and so intelligent, this is why they're a gift, is they send you a warning. They send you symptoms and say, make a change, because that's what that really means. And so what, what, what Cena just covered was all the, again, the chemistry, but again, now we're going to move into this emotional, spiritual side, which is really one of the big reasons why I wanted to have you on, because I know making these kinds of breakthroughs can be huge, and I want you to share what helped you um, as you as you kind of com not completed your journey, but just really put the icing on the proverbial gluten free cake um, of your health. Yes, I would love to share. Um, so, as I mentioned, I got into remission, and what I realized was I didn't want to be in remission. <laughs> like, so, for me, um, what would happen is if I got too stressed for instance, or ate too much sugar, even if it was fruit sugar, I would experience pain in my right forearm, right? Uh, indicating inflammation there. And um, it was like, it was like a flare up, right? In the autoimmune community, we talk about flare ups and then we talk about remission. And a lot of people view remission as a good thing. Um, in fact, that is often people's goal when they have an autoimmune disease like cancer. Uh, I decided that I didn't want to be in remission and I decided that I didn't believe in remission. So this gets into the whole spiritual emotional component because your perception, your beliefs um, dictate your perception and the perception um, fuels your emotion, what emotion you're going to experience. So for me, perception is a huge um, dictator in terms of if you're going to stay sick if you're going to get sick and if you're going to actually fully heal or if you're going to stay in remission. So it started with my perception. So remission for a lot of people is actually a space of fear, right? For me, it became, I recognized it as a limiting belief. So it's like if, okay, if you eat the wrong food or you stress out too much, there's this fear that you hold on to that the disease is going to come back. And in fact, if you look at the definition of um, remission in the dictionary, it is a temporary recovery, or it means to abate symptoms for a period of time. If you look at um, the National Cancer Institute, their definition of remission is that the cancer has disappeared, although cancer may still be in the body. And that's a direct quote from them. So to me, remission means you're not really healed. It means you're on your way to being healed but you're not there yet. And I didn't want to be stuck in that space of fear, afraid, 
that if I was going to eat the wrong thing or whatnot, it was going to come back. So I dug deeper at this point and I realized that there is this emotional component, this energetic component of, of disease and of healing. And so I'll try to, I'll kind of walk you through it a little bit. Um, we all know that at this point that the body is made up of energy, right? We even measure this Western medicine acknowledges this as well. You measure it like an EKG will measure electrical signals in the heart. Um, EEG measures electrical signals, signals in the brain. So we know we are electrical beings and the NIH has actually given, um, given a definition and a term for this. It's called the biofield. So the biofield is a collection of all the energy that your body is um, producing and, you know, kind of in a layman's terms. Um, but in that definition, they also talk about how it's not just the energy, it's the information that's carried on that energy. So we know that energy carries information with it. So we used to think that emotions were stored in your amygdala. And now we're actually thinking that's probably not true. We think that emotions are probably stored in your biofield and then um, also further downstream in your structured water. So what I have found in my own research and healing journey is that the biofield itself governs the physical body, including gene expression, hormone production, and so forth. So when you have a physical ailment or a disease, what it means is you have an energetic imbalance in your biofield. And so if you think about it from this perspective, what are emotions, right? Emotions are energy. They're energy that resonates at a certain frequency. And your body is energy. The biofield represents that energy, kind of like a cloud you can think of. It comes from all outside, all so um, sources of all aspects of your body emit this um, biofield. And so your emotions are actually these energetic imprints on these biofields. So if you have a stuck emotion, we'll say, it means you have that energetic imprint or that frequency imprinted on your biofield. And what, me what that means is we used to think that your genes were your blueprint for your, your physical body, right? That this gene would be um, transcribed and translated and it produced um, these proteins and you'd form these organs or you'd express these hormones when certain genes were, were read. And so we called the DNA our blueprint. But now what we're realizing is the DNA is downstream of the biofield. So the biofield itself may actually be this energetic blueprint, if you will, that actually dictates which genes are expressed. So if you, if you know, if you're familiar with the work of like Bruce Lipton and Dr. Candace Pert, they'll talk about molecules of emotion, right? And so, so let's start there. That's easier for people to grasp. So what they were able to figure out is that each a type of emotion elicits neuropeptides. And if you don't have any stuck emotions in your body, any stuck energy, those neuropeptides can be metabolized and they're released through like your sweat, your breath, and your urine. But if you have what we call stuck energy, those neuropeptides can't actually be metabolized and excreted. So they stay in the body and they can result in inflammation, which as you know, can result in any autoimmune or chronic illness. They can result in things like um, gut dysbiosis or hormonal imbalances or overactive or underactive immune system. Um, so that's kind of the physical layer of understanding of how emotions can actually um, elicit disease. But if you go a step back, so if you go upstream from that physical layer, you go to the energetic layer, you'll see that what actually causes those neuropeptides to be transcribed and translated by your genes, right? What's causing that? Well, in that physical layer, in that physical level, the genes are actually held into place, we think, by structured water. So the water in your body isn't just flowing around like this water in my cup, right? It's structured, meaning it's more like jello. 
And when it has a coherent structure, it's coherent water, we call that healthy, right? For really kind of boiling this down, that's like healthy. You want it to be structured water. When it's incoherent or unstructured, um, that's when you're going to have um, genes expressed, for instance, that will elicit like pro-inflammatory cytokines, things like that. So what we think is happening is the structure of the water itself holds the gene in place. So what that means is, okay, now back it up one. What's, what, is, what information is the structure of water receiving to let it know how, what configuration am I going to hold these genes in, right? Well, it turns out the structure of water, we think, is receiving signals from the biofield. As you know, I've just mentioned that the energy of the biofield, it's not just energy, these waves, it actually has information on it. So whatever the energetic imprints are in your biofield, it's sending information to the structured water, which can either make it coherent or incoherent, which then changes which genes are going to be expressed by actually physically changing the conformation of the DNA. So if you have, if you're holding on to like these stuck emotions, like anger, right? Say like in my case, um, one of my biggest breakthroughs was when I forgave my stepfather. He molested me for eight years. I had a lot of anger involved with that. And I was holding it in my biofield. I was holding that energetic imprint in my biofield. That means that low frequency, right? Um, uh, let's call them undesirable or toxic emotions, even though I hate to label them. But for simplicity, these toxic emotions have a lower energy frequency than emotions like gratitude or love, which have a higher energy frequency. So by hanging on to this anger, it was an energetic imprint in my biofield that was low frequency. And it was sending that information to my structured water, which was then causing my genes to transcribe and translate molecules that would be on the same frequency level, if you will, as anger. So I was creating disease in my body and I was perpetuating it because I had that blueprint in my biofield that was constantly sending information to my physical body of how it should respond to the environment. So I, do you want me to pause there or did I do okay explaining I, I that? Think, I think you're doing great because um, this is a super complex topic and um, no, I think you're doing well. Keep, keep going, keep going. Okay. And so let me tie in. So for those of you who are going to try to tie in like Bruce Lipton, you've heard, you know, molecules of emotion. So those neuropeptides that they're talking about that are produced by, um, by different emotions, they're produced by the emotion that's sitting in your biofield, for instance. So it, it causes the, the structured water to hold the gene differently, which then causes the gene to transcribe and translate that specific neuropeptide that is that matches the frequency of that emotion so that emotion sent that information to develop to transcribe and translate that neuropeptide so i'm not saying anything that's opposite of each other these things all um are they these things all work together very nicely what i'm saying is don't stop at the physical level so don't just stop at understanding that oh on the physical level we have these neuropeptides are produced because we're not just physical beings. As you so eloquently stated, it is important to address your triggers on the physical level, but we have to, as a society, get past this concept that we're just physical. We're not, and this was hard for me too, because I was Western trained. I was trained that the body is a machine and as a machine, it has different parts and it works well, as long as you have all the parts, like you have all the vitamins and minerals and cofactors and enzymes, then the machine is well-oiled and it works well, right? And it doesn't work well if you have things that disrupt the machine, like toxins, like the heavy metals and glyphosate. And that's the extent of what we're taught. And that's what most of us think. So when we try to reverse the disease, we look for the physical triggers and then we're like, okay, we're done. But that's not the end of the story, right? Because we are actually light energy, right? The body is actually energy. And so we need to address um, the energetic level as well. That's what I did. I addressed the energy level and that's how I got out of remission and where now I am fully healed. So I never have flare-ups, no matter what lab tests I have, there's no markers of any kind of disease, even using the functional test, 
There's no markers of any kind of inflammation or disease. My body has reached a balance. And that's what you're talking about with that triad. I finally reached a balance. And that's because I address the physical, the emotional, mental, and the spiritual. So the bottom line here is if you have, um, if you heal the energy and balance, you can actually help heal the physical body. And we know this to be true. We know in the scientific medical literature, there's things called spontaneous healings, right? These happen. If you read through these, these are largely because of an emotional release of a trapped toxic emotion. And usually it's from forgiveness, right? People are actually forgiving and letting go. So there was this one, I love if, if I can share this one story to really drive this point home, there was a woman, and this is documented in the literature. There's a woman who was diagnosed with cancer and her husband had recently cheated on her and left her for another woman. And the doctor said, this is inoperable. There's nothing we can do about it. She comes back a little bit later. They're like, now it's stage four. It's, you know, basically say your goodbyes. So she left and she decided to get her closest girlfriends together. They had a burning party. So they started this bonfire in her backyard and that she took every single item of her ex-husband and she threw it in the fire. But not only that, she screamed and yelled like any, all the emotions that she had, all the anger, all the frustration she had, all the disappointment and the rage, she just screamed and cried and cried. And the women like, oh, I'm getting all emotional because to have that kind of community, you know, that, that women um, circled around her and gave her that safe space, that support to do that. in. she goes back to the doctor, the tumor's gone. She didn't do anything else. She released all of these energetic imprints that were on her biofield. And that, because it's upstream of the body, that healed her physical body. So that's just one example of how important emotions are. Um, another one I like to share is, you know, my mother, my mother's example. Um, she, like me, was very sick and was about to die. Actually, I got the call. Um, she lives in California. I was out in Virginia. I got the call in the middle of the night. She's not going to make it through the night. She had already, she'd been sick since her, since her twenties. She had had um, chronic kidney disease. So her kidney had already failed years before she was on a, uh, she had a kidney transplant. So the remaining kidney was failing to get in the hospital. She had type two diabetes, Hashimoto's pancreatitis, um, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, skin cancer, grand mal seizures, like you name it. She probably had it. Right. So they, I get the call that she's about to die. So I fly, I immediately get in the car and I fly to California and, um, I get there and long story short, well, actually you were there to, uh, on the phone to help me walk through it. And, um, they said, she's, she's going to die. So just say your goodbyes. Like there's nothing else we can do. And I said, no, that's not good enough. She's coming home with me. So her husband had passed away. You know, he all, I also got the call for him that night that he wasn't going to make it. Her husband ends up passing away. And so she comes and lives with me. And that was my stepfather. So she's in my house. Um, you know, I brought you on my team again. You helped find these physical triggers using the functional tests because I was not objective. <laughs> I was very emotionally <laughs> entwined with this. Um, and within about seven months, every single disease that she had reversed all of them, even the diabetes, which she had had for decades. She was on insulin. I mean, she she had to take insulin before every single meal and before bedtime. The diabetes was gone. The Hashimoto's was gone. Like can, the cancer went away. The kidney bounced back and was actually at a normal range, not normal for a transplanted kidney, normal for if it was your own biological kidney, like remarkable, right? So a few months later, she ends up dying. Even though she was in her 70s, healthy as she had ever been in her entire life, all, of the, all the doctors couldn't believe that she was healed. They kept running all these tests, trying to find everything. Even the, the plaque that was in her heart reversed. Everything went away, but she still died a couple months later. And it was because 
She had stress induced cardiomyopathy. She died of a broken heart. She, she was doing okay. And then on the anniversary of her husband's death, she felt pain in her heart and we rushed her to the hospital and they ran all these tests and they actually diagnosed her. These are Western doctors. They said, this is stress induced cardiomyopathy. Did something just happen to her? And I said, yes, this is the anniversary of her husband's death. And they said, she is dying of a broken heart. So to me, that's a story of not only the power of your emotions, right? Totally physically healthy, but she died because she couldn't deal with the grief, with the loss, with the fear of being alone. But it's also, she leaves behind this amazing legacy for me of this gift that God has given us, the gift of regeneration of your body, right? She didn't want to be healed. And that's what I learned later after we fully reversed the diseases. And I'm sitting there with her when we learned that she's died of a broken heart. I said to her, I'm sorry. I just realized I never asked you if you wanted to live. I just took charge and gave it everything I got to save you because before her husband died, he asked me to save her, but I never asked what she wanted. And she looked at me and there was this moment of clarity and I'll never forget it. She looked me in the eyes and said, thank you. I don't want to live. She wanted to be with her husband. So I honored that. I honor her last request. But the amazing legacy she leaves behind for me, for my kids who saw this happen, was that even though she didn't want to live, her body her body recovered. It regenerated itself, right? We removed, like you said, we got rid of all these physical triggers, gave it the nutrients it needed. And in spite of her not wanting to live, it healed itself. And that's our gift that God's given every single one of us. And we, we know this is true through the scientific literature as well, through the discovery of stem cells, right? We can regenerate any organ, any system in our body, if we just learn how to tap into that and we want it, right? If you ask God for it and you want it. So my mom didn't want her second chance, but that's an amazing story that she, that I like to share because I think she would want everyone to know that if you want it, God has given you that gift. Yeah, that's so powerful. So powerful. Wow. Th- thank you for, for sharing that because I know that wasn't easy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's when I'm still processing, as you can tell the emotions um, from that. Uh, I, that's still a, um, a, an energetic imprint in my biofield <laughs> that I'm learning how to, how to transmute, you know, I'm learning to be the witness to it instead of judging it, you know, 